This is probably the most planning I have ever put into an episode. <laughs> Actually, why did I say probably? It definitely is. Usually I just... Usually I'm like, hey, I have an idea for an episode. And then I plug in my mic and hit record. I'm like, hey, I'm going to improvise. <laughs> and I've been planning this episode for like two weeks. <clears throat> And I'm still going to improvise, because I can't do a script. <laughs> I learned that the hard way long ago on my YouTube channel, and I would try to script episodes on there. Not even episodes, just skits. And I wouldn't do any good. And as, as I kind of proved with the uh, a few episodes back, when I was re reading the ghost stories that I wrote, and I... It's the closest thing to a script I've had on here. And I couldn't even follow that. So, I still didn't script this. So, before I get into the topic, I want to kind of address the ending of the last episode where I talked about, well, I don't know how this is going to go. I It's kind of a little update on how that went. Um, right, so the... The app I'm using to record, it's literally just called Voice Recorder. It's, I, it just looks like a generic... It kind of... It's, it's basically a generic voice recorder. But it's, like, flashy because, like, it's doing the, the... The visualizations as I'm talking, so I know that's actually working. Which is important to me because sometimes when I plug my mic in, it, it doesn't do anything. And I have to... Unplug it, plug it back in, plug it, unplug it, look at it, there. Nah. So, having that visualization kind of helps me. And I picked it because it's, it was, I scrolled down until I f saw the highest rated one, and this one's 4.8 out of 5, so I was like, that's the one. So, it records, it has two file formats you can record in, one's MP3, one's WAV. And when I went to upload to podcastic it wouldn't I had it I had it recording in mp3 format and it wouldn't post to podcastic and I was using the mobile site and it said file format has to be in either mp3 or m4a and I use a file converter to convert it into mp3 from mp3 thinking maybe it's like a different kind of mp3? I don't know. But that still didn't work. I converted it to m4a. Still didn't work. And I was getting frustrated. I was like, no, I don't want to record the whole thing again. So I went and I decided... <laughs> last did Jefford. I actually emailed me. I emailed myself the file. Downloaded it on the computer. And tried uploading it to the website. Then it worked. So, that was a relief. <laughs> in hindsight, I could have just plugged in my phone to the computer and moved the file onto the computer. But I was too lazy to dig out the cable. And then I, and then I literally found it already plugged in to the computer. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a thing. And then kind of a side note, I was not expecting this. Um, I woke up and to find that the podcastic Twitter account, they, 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 apparently they listened to the episode and they actually, they shout, they gave like a shout out and actually I want to read the tweet. I was, I was not expecting this. Uh, where is it? I don't know. Notifications. Okay. <clears throat> Where is it? Basically, thank me for taking the time to explain the reason for my migration to punk, uh, podcastic. And it said, very interesting for us to hopefully, uh, very interesting for us and hopefully for others. We continue to work to bring you more features in the coming months. I think that's a reference to me saying that I wanted an app, which the an app would be really easy like it would make it would be really nice it would be very helpful uh but yeah like i it's not mandatory because like i can 
I can do this without an app, apparently, because I did it. I did that episode without an app. But it would definitely make it easier because I kind of, <laughs> I had to do a few extra steps just to get it on. Um, but I mean, I didn't know I had, I didn't know what I was doing at that point because it was my first time uploading on there. Now I know what to do. I'm going to plug this into the, uh, this. <laughs> oh, there I am doing a visual motion on an audio platform I pointed at my phone <laughs> I'm gonna plug my phone into the computer and move the file there instead of freaking out like why isn't it working so that makes it much easier to know that step I didn't know that before and now I do and I think if they do an app that hopefully they have that fixed I don't know I don't know the difference between the mobile website and the desktop website but for some reason, it's the same file, literally the same file. The mobile site wouldn't take it, and the desktop site would. So, hopefully, if they do an app, that's fixed, because that was a little annoying. Well, moving on from there, uh, another thing I was talking about at the end of the last episode was YouTube. The uh, pod, as far as I could tell, at least from what I found, it there isn't a way for it to automatically post to YouTube and make its own format and all that. So I said in the last episode that if it doesn't do it automatically, I'm just going to stop YouTube for the podcast and... I just found that it didn't post, and I was like, okay, that's it. I even messaged a friend. I uh, When I make the thumbnails, I have to message them to a friend so I can download them to my phone and post them on Instagram. So I messaged him, and I said, okay, no more thumbnails. And he goes, why? And I told him. He was like, aw. And then I randomly sent him a thumbnail. I decided that... All I really need is the thumbnail and the audio file, which I already have both of. Well, if I make... Cause I really like making the thumbnails. Cause I like I like photo editing and making logos and stuff. So that was just kind of like a fun side thing I was doing. But I didn't want to stop. So I realized that I didn't have to just use them for the thumbnails. That is now the video. So I just take the thumbnail... Make it go into my. I have a video. I have a video editor on my phone. Uh, d um, d d uh, project, project director, I think. I use it all the time. I've had it for years. I have the paid version, and I still can't tell you what it's called. So I hmm. Cyberlink, think I think I don't know. I, I use it for years, I love it, I still can't tell you what it's called. But, basically, I just, I took the audio that I uploaded, and the thumbnail that I made, which is just the, the podcast logo, with my logo, because I always, I take the, my logo at the, t it's at the top, and then I just, I put something in the bottom half that represents the episode, and that's the thumbnail. Well, yesterday's episode was about podcasts, basically, and so that was the I used their logo as the uh, as like the episode icon thing, and yeah, that's that's the video now, just the the thumbnail and the audio, <laughs> very simple. So I'm still gonna keep doing the YouTube videos. It's just one extra step on top of the other extra steps I'm having to do. Not a big deal. Anyway, um, so the episode, it, you've probably seen the title and are wondering why it's taking me 10 minutes to get to it. I wanted to get that stuff out of the way first. Before I got into the topic I've been waiting for, uh, I've been planning on doing the last couple weeks. Uh, I, when I started this podcast, I know in my introductory episode, I said I'm not going to cover true crime because I don't I don't want to cover true crime because I don't feel like I could do it right, and 
there's people that do it better and if I do true crime I'd basically just be copying what everyone else does I'd basically just be taking one of their episodes and reading their script verbatim pretty much and I still feel that way I don't want to cover true crime regularly I don't want to become a true crime podcast I listen to true crime I don't want to become true crime podcast if that makes sense so but um I did want to cover this I decided if I did cover a true crime case it would probably be this one because I <laughs> I don't know how to word this without it sounding weird but it's my f it's my favorite true crime case I I was obsessed with it long ago I I still kind of am. Like, I, if I see something about this topic anywhere, like if it's trending or something, then I'll look. I'll, I'm going to click on it. It's like, if it's like pizza. Someone says, "Do you want a da 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 pizza?" And I'm like, "I don't. I I don't care. It's pizza. I'll take it. Pineapple on pizza? Yes, please." <laughs> <coughs> 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 that was out of nowhere. <coughs> oh, wow. Okay. But anyway, the topic is the Zodiac Killer. Which you probably knew if you read the title. <laughs> so, and yes, it took me almost 12 minutes to get to that. So... I want to cover the Zodiac Killer because, well, for one thing, it's my favorite uh, true crime story, and the I wanted I wanted to cover it also because even though pretty much everybody knows about the Zodiac Killer, but they don't know about the Zodiac Killer. <laughs> they don't really know the story; they just know about it, you know. So. I figured I would cover it, and there's also a lot of a lot of things about it that a lot of people don't like. Even the people that that like follow it don't know, because I've like I said I was obsessed with it for the longest time, and okay I, I'm gonna start out by I'm gonna cover the official story, like the official confirmed. Where are the rubber stopper end things on my tripod feet. That's weird. <laughs> there are rubber ends on, like, rubber caps at the end of my tripod. Uh, my microphone's little tripod. And they're gone. I just noticed that they're gone. But anyway, there's an, you know, the official story. And then there's, there's theories and speculations. Unconfirmed cases. And I want to get into some of those. But I'm going to, before I get into any of that, I'm actually, I'm on the Wikipedia for the Zodiac Killer. I'm going to cover the confirmed cases. And there are, okay, I'm just going to read the, okay. the Zodiac Killer is a pseudonym of an American serial killer who operated in Northern California from at least the late 1960 to the early 1970s. His identity remains unknown. The killer originated uh, the yeah, the killer originated the name in a series of taunting letters and cards sent to the San Francisco Bay Area Press. These letters included four cryptograms or ciphers. Of the four cryptograms sent, only one has been definitively solved. <clears throat> the Zodiac murders, wait, pff, the Zodiac murdered five known victims and Benicia. V Vallejo, Napa County, and San Francisco, respectively, between December 1968 and October 1969. He targeted young couples with two two of the men surviving attempted murder. He also murdered a male cab driver. The Zodiac himself once claimed to have murdered 37 victims. The San Francisco Police Department marked the case inactive in April 2004, but reopened it at some point prior to March 2007. The case also remains open in the city of Vallejo, as well as in Napa County and Solano County. The California Department of Justice has maintained an open case file on the Zodiac murder since 1969. 
And that's the introductory, uh, introductory, introductory section of the Wikipedia. And I'm gonna get over the, go over the confirmed murders because, like I said, he claimed to have killed a lot more than what's confirmed. There are five known. Wait, then okay. Yes, there are five confirmed murders that they know for a fact are the Zodiac Killer. But there are potentially more. And I I, I do believe that there are more. Some of the unconfirmed, I do believe, is the Zodiac. And then, you know, then there's others that are out there, which I'll get into that later on. I just, I'm going to cover the confirmed one first. Okay, although the Zodiac could, uh, claimed to have committed thir 37 murders in letters to the newspapers, investigators agree that only seven confirmed victims, two of whom survived. They are David Arthur Faraday, 17, and Betty Lou Jensen, 16, shot and killed on December 20th, 1968, on Lake, Lake Herman Road, within the city limits of Benicia. Coordinate... Uh, no, I'm not going to read the coordinates. It includes the coordinates, because... Wikipedia. Uh, Michael Mag... Okay, I've heard his name a million times. I still can't pronounce it. Michael Magu? Magu? Meh. He survived, so... It's not like... I don't know. <laughs> um, Michael... Let's say Mike. Uh, 19 and Darlene Farron, 22, shot on July 4th, 1969 in the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo. While Mike survived the attack, Farron was pronounced dead on arrival at the Kaiser Foundation Hospital. Brian Hartnell, 20, and Cecilia and Shepard, 22, stabbed on, the tw on September 27, 1969 at Lake Berryessa in Napa County. Hartnell survived eight stab wounds to, his, to the back. But Shepard died as a result of, the result of her injuries on September 29th, 1969. Paul Lee Stein, 29, shot and killed on October 11th, 1969, in the Presidio Heights neighborhood in San Francisco. <coughs> Those are the confirmed cases. The uh, Lake Herman Road murders, both victims died, as stated above. I'm going to read some of this. The first murders widely attributed to the Zodiac Killer were the shootings of high school students Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday on December 20th, 1968 on Lake Herman Road, just inside uh, Benice Benicia's city limits. The couple were on their first date and planned to attend a Christmas concert at Hogan Christmas... Wow. At Christmas High... High... Chris... My... <laughs> I'm not good at spoking. Uh, planned to attend a Christmas concert at Hogan High School about three blocks from Jensen's home. The couple instead visited a friend before stopping at a local restaurant and then driving out to Lake Herman Road. At about 10.15 p.m., Faraday parked her, her, his mother's Rambler on the gravel turn, turnout, which is a well-known lover's lane. Shortly after 11 p.m., their bodies were found by Stella Borges, who lived nearby. The Solano County Sheriff's Department investigated the crime, but no leads developed. Utilizing available forensic data, Robert Gray Smith postulated that another car pulled into the turnabout, a turn, turnout just prior to 11 p.m. and parked beside the couple. The killer apparently exited the second car and walked toward the Rambler, possibly ordering the couple out of the Rambler. Jensen appeared to have exited the car first. Yet, when Faraday was halfway out, the killer apparently shot him in the head. The killer then shot Jensen five times in the back as she as she fled. Her body was found with twenty uh, tw uh wow, her body was found twenty eight feet from the car. The killer then drove off. <coughs> Blue Rock Springs murder. This is the the murder that opened. Oh, almost dropped the mic. Uh, in the film Zodiac, this is the murder that opens the movie and the the Lake Herman Road murders I, I was actually shocked to find this out um, a lot of people don't know about that um, 
because what most people know about the Zodiac Killer comes from the movie. And since it starts with the Blue Rock Springs murder, that people don't know about the Lake Herman Road murder. They... It even says in the in the movie, like, I also killed those kids last Christmas. Uh, that means there was a previous murder. murder. But, yeah. Just before midnight on July 4th, 1969, Darlene Farron and Michael Magu... I feel embarrassed that I can't pronounce his last name because, again, I've heard it a million times. Uh, drove into the Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, four miles from Lake from the Lake Herman Road murder site, and parked. While the couple sat in Farron's car, a second car drove uh, drove into the lot and parked alongside them, but also immediately drove away. Returning about ten minutes later, the second car parked behind them. The driver of the second car then exited the vehicle, approaching the passenger side of Farron's car, carrying a flashlight and a nine millimeter Luger. The killer directed the flashlight at Mike's, Mike and Farron's face, eyes, before shooting at them, firing five times. Both victims were hit, and several bullets had passed through uh, Mike and to Farron. The killer walked away from the car, but upon hearing Mike's moaning, returned and shot each victim twice more before driving off. Every time I say Mike, it shows his last name, and I, I don't want to... I don't want to stumble over it every time, so I'm just going to say Mike. <laughs> on July 5th, 1969, at 12.40 a.m., a man phoned the Vallejo Police Department to report and claim responsibility for the attack. The killer also took credit for the murders of Jensen and Faraday six and a half months earlier. Police traced the call to a phone booth that, at a gas station at Springs Road and Tulemen. Located about three tenths of a mile from the from Farron's house, and only a few blocks from the Vallejo Police Department, Farron was pronounced dead at the hospital. Mike survived the attack, despite being shot in the face, neck, and chest. Mike described the, his attacker as as a 26 to seven. Uh, yeah, I, I looked away and I kept trying to read. As a 26 to 30 year old, 195 to 200 pound, or possibly even more, uh, 5 foot 8 inch white male with short, light brown, curly hair. And then there's a long section, which I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, basically, the Zodiac started sending letters to the uh, San Francisco Cr uh, Chronicle and the San Francisco Examiner and the Vallejo Times Herald and they also came with ciphers which uh, the film shows I love the way the film shows this because it shows like the FBI trying to solve it and like the military trying to solve it and like professional code breakers trying to solve it and then it cuts to the, this this couple out in the country and like one's a teacher and like one's like a farmer or something I don't remember who did it uh I, wait it should, it should probably say here uh Donald and Betty Harden of Salinas California it doesn't say what they were but I, I'm pretty sure she was a teacher but anyway these two random people pe people these two random people solved it after all these professionals couldn't. I thought that was, that was interesting. Lake Barry the murder. Oh, that was even longer. The Lake Barry the murder is, I think... Uh, actually, all of these murders could be considered like the definitive Zodiac killing, but the uh, this one's probably one of the more important ones. But now that I word it like that, I don't. It doesn't come out. It comes off really wrong. Uh, the 
the sketch we have of him and like the executioner outfit and the way we always see him comes from this murder. In fact, there was a, a few years ago they made this really stupid, it was like a horror slasher film. It was about the Zodiac Killer, but it was like 100% fictional. And he walked, he, like, he went around and now he was like a Michael Myers character. And he wore that execution executioner outfit everywhere, like out in public and like walking down the street and stabbing people. I was like, this is stupid. He wore it the one time, and it was out in the daytime. But yeah, so anyway, the. On September 27th, 1969, Pacific Union College students Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were picnicking at Lake Berryessa on a small, small island by the sand split by Twin Oak Ridge. Wait, split to Twin Oak Ridge. Someone about 5 foot 11 weighing more than 170 pounds with combed greasy brown hair approached them wearing a black executioner's type hood with clip-on sunglasses over a glasses hole and a bib black device on his chest that had a white 3 by 3 inch cross circle symbol on it. You know, the zodiac symbol. Looks like crosshairs. He approached them with a gun, which Hartnell believed to, uh, to be a 45. The, ho the hooded man claimed to be an escaped con... I got distracted by the visualization on my phone. Um, where was I? The hooded man claimed to be an escaped convict from a jail with a two-word name in either Colorado or Montana. A police officer later in inferred he had been referring to a jail in Deer Lodge, Montana, where he had killed a guard and subsequently stolen a car, explaining that he now needed their car and money to go to Mexico. And the vehicle he had driving was too hot, quote, unquote. He had brought pre-cut links of plastic clothesline and told Shepard to tie up Hartnell before he tied her up. The killer checked and tightened Hartnell's bonds after discovering Shepard had bound Hartnell's hands loosely. Hartnell initially believed this event to be a bizarre robbery, but the man drew a knife and stabbed them both repeatedly. Hartnell received receiving six and Shepard ten wounds in the process. The killer then hiked 500 yards back to Knoxville Road, up to Knoxville Road, drew the cross circle symbol on Hartnell's car door with a black felt tip pen and wrote beneath it Vallejo 122068 7469 September 27, uh, 69, 6.30 by knife. By 7.40 p.m., the killer called the uh, Napa County Sheriff's Office from a pay, uh, pay telephone to report th this latest crime. The caller first stated to the operator that he wished to report a murder, no, a double murder, before stating that he had been the perpetrator of the crime. The phone was found still off the hook minutes later at the Napa Car Wash on Main Street in Napa by KVON radio reporter Pat Stanley, only a few blocks from the sheriff's office, yet 27 miles from the crime scene. Detectives were able to lift a still wet palm print from the telephone, but was never able to match it to any suspect. After hearing their screams for help, a man and his son who were fishing in a nearby cove discovered the victims and summoned help by contacting park rangers napa county sheriff's Dep deputies Col uh, dave collins and ray land were the first law enforcement officers to arrive at the crime scene the city of shepherd was conscious when collins arrived providing him with a detailed description of the attacker hartnell and Sh <coughs> <coughs> hartnell and shepherd were taken to queen of the valley hospital in napa by ambulance Shepard lapsed into a coma during transport to the hospital and never regained consciousness. She died two days later. But Hartnell survived to recount his tale to the press. 
Napa County Sheriff Detective Ken Nar uh, Narlal, who was assigned to the case from the outset, worked on solving the crime until his retirement from the department in 1987. Now, in the last episode, I talked about oh, there's a documentary I wanted to watch again, followed by the movie, which I did that last night. Uh, the documentary is actually... I, when I first saw it, it was on the Zodiac Blu-ray. It was the two-disc director's cut, and the cover of the Blu-ray was, it looked like the, 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 the letter that he sent. And the documentary is called This is the Zodiac, speaking. And it is, it, it's not your usual documentary, it's just interviews. I mean, it's literally just interviews, but it's with, like, there's no narration or anything. It's, it's the people that were involved, the police involved, the survivors, the, uh, the operator that, uh, I mean, the dispatcher that picked up the phone. Yeah, like, it interviewed, like, everybody that was still alive and agreed to it the uh yeah it was it's a really good documentary and i'm sure like i think a, a few people like i over the years and you know, i there's people they know they're into true crime and they want documentaries that are you know action field and uh making a murderer or something like that and this is not that. So I, like, I'll, I'll tell them, like, hey, Zodiac, there's a documentary. It's the best one. And they're like, ooh, just send it my way. And I send them the YouTube link. And they're like, this is boring. It's like, this is the people telling their story. You want flashy graphics and a narrator narration and all that? That, I mean, that would probably, I mean, there's a million Zodiac documentaries like that. This gives the full story from the people that lived it. What was I getting at? Oh, Brian Hartnell was, uh, he was in the documentary, and I really, uh, him and Mike both were in the documentary, and I feel really bad for Mike. He got shot through the jaw, and it came out, like, the, he was, like, I think he was, like, shot in the jaw, and it came out the other side of his face, and you could tell, like, it kind of messed up his face a little, uh, his, his speaking, it's kind of hard to understand him, and, like, he even says that, um, like, he's got, like, some mental scars, which I, w I wouldn't be surprised, like, I would be surprised if he didn't, and, uh, I, I kind of felt bad for him, but then it showed Brian Hartnell, and if I were to run into him, I wouldn't, I would I wouldn't know he survived something like that. Of course, he didn't get shot in the face, so... I mean, he got stabbed in the back, so... yeah. But he's walking and stuff. Um, I really like Brian Hartnell. Like, whenever, every time he talked, I was like, Yay, it's him! And it, like, it shows him, like, he goes back to the crime scene, and he shows, he, like, relives it. He was like, Zodiac was standing there, and I was, I was laying here, and then they were over there, and... And it was really interesting. It's one of the few times that it's not just the the person sitting down talking. And with him, it's really interesting because, like it said, like he talked to the press. He lived, and he talked to the press. But he was still in the hospital recovering, and he was interviewed and told his story. And so it kept cutting back and forth between him in 1969 telling the story, and then him in 2007 telling the story. And so, it was, and like, but like his story never changed. Because so, it the way it worked out is like he would start a sentence in 1969, and 2007 Brian Hartnell would finish the sentence, because his story never changed, and it's the same story, and it's it kind of worked out that way. It's really cool how they flash back and forth between past him and current him. <coughs> And he's like, he's so fun to, to like, he, I, I, I like listening to him talk. He's really fun to, even though he's talking about, like, probably the most horrific thing that's ever happened to him, 
it's like it's kind of fun listening to him because the way he tells the story, he's like he can tell he's really intelligent and and like he has a way with words and like his voice is really nice and all of that. It's, I really liked when Brian Hartnell was on, uh, was on camera. I tried looking to see if there was like any more updates on him because I looked. Some of the people they were interviewed has since passed away. Like the dispatcher, she's. Uh, I really liked her too. Um, she sadly passed away in 2012. Um, and I know uh, David David Toski. He was the. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. He was one of the detectives. I think he was the head detective. In San Francisco. In fact, uh, Dirty Harry was actually inspired by David Toskey, the character, and then uh, he was like a really influential person. And he's also since passed away. I think it was a couple years ago, unfortunately. So I was looking, I was actually looking to see if Mike or David, I mean, uh, see if the the two survivors that were interviewed Mike and then Brian Hartnell to see like where are they now have they since passed away I don't know I I seriously could not find anything but there are zodiac websites there are um let's see let me go to yeah I sh probably should have pulled this up before I started recording zodiac killer I think it's dot net dot I would say dot com. Let's start there. That is, I'm not connected. Oh, my, uh, my Wi-Fi is off. Um, okay, reconnect. There we go. All right, refresh. <laughs> there we go. So. Well, yeah, see, they keep this updated. It says, updated October 27th, 2020, and it's October 30th, 2020, so they 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 keep this updated. Here's the latest. As of October 22nd, 27th, 2020, so it's been 50 years since Paul Avery received his Halloween card from the Zodiac Killer. Enjoy a spooky look at vintage secret pal cards with some help of... Wait... Oh, it's no okay. It's nothing really important, really, because it's that. Um, <laughs> yeah, this. Uh, wow, they regularly update this. That's that's kind of cool. Um, all right. I want to see if the two victims, uh, the two survivors, are still alive. That's what I want to see. So I'm going to go back to the home page and it says Zodiac Victims. Uh, let's see. There's everyone. <laughs> and I don't think it says Yeah, I'm not seeing anything about that. Anyway, I, I would... Oh, wait. Hmm? No. There is... Maybe it... Surviving victim. He's, it's him in 44. Um... I don't know. So... Again, like, there's, I, as you can imagine, they're probably not in the spotlight very much. They came forward to do this documentary because the movie was coming out. I know Brian Hartnell, he was, like, a consultant for the movie. And, uh, because they, that, that was kind of a big deal. And the, the lady who was the dispatcher, she was also, like, the, she also kind of helped with that. And, like, a bunch of people like that movie it, there's like I said earlier there was a bunch of Zodiac movies and a lot of them are fiction some of them are really bad and I had seen before this movie came out I had seen a Zodiac killer movie it tried to tell the true story 
but they tr they also tried to sensationalize it. They focused on the killings, and they made it like like a gory fest, and they they tried to turn it into a horror film, which it, it it's a horror film because it's you know it's the Zodiac killer and he's a murderer, and these people are you know he he kills these people, so it's a horror film, but in the movie Zodiac, it's those scenes are in there and they're graphic when they have to be but they're not like over the top it's it's not a horror film it's it's like a like a, a, a crime movie like a true crime movie and they got it as accurate as they could and they filmed on location when they could and yeah and like the people that were involved consulted in them with the movie and it was very tr it's like as close to the truth as they could have gotten and I, I really liked it and now on to the Presidio Heights murder so two weeks <clears throat> wait uh, uh, two weeks later on October 11th 1969 a white male passenger entered a cab driven by Paul Stein at the intersection of Mason and Geary streets one block west from Union Square in San Francisco requesting to be taken to Washington and Maple Streets in Presidio Heights. <coughs> For reasons unknown, Stein drove one block past Maple to Cherry Street. The passenger then shot Stein once in the head with a 9mm, took Stein's wallet and car keys, and tore away a section of Stein's bloodstained shirt Hill. This passenger was observed by three, teenage, three teenagers across the street at 9.55 p.m. who called the police while the crime was in progress. They observed a man wiping, down, uh, wiping the cab down before walking away towards the, the Presidio, one block to the north. Two blocks from the crime scene, patrol officer Don... Folk, nah. and Eric Zelms responding to the call observed a white man walking along the sidewalk east on Jackson Street and stepping on, onto a stairway leading up to the front yard of one of the homes on the north side of the street. To inc the encounter lasted only 5 to 10 seconds. Uh, one of the officers estimated the white, the white male pedestrian to be 35 to 45 years old, 5'10". Five foot ten f tall with a crew cut similar to but slightly older than the description of the teenagers who observed the killer in and out of Stein's cab. As a 35 to 30 year old crew cut white male was about five eight five foot eight to five foot nine inch tall. The police radio dispatcher had, however, initially state uh, alerted officers to be on the lookout for a black suspect. So the officers drove past him without stopping. The mix-up in descriptions remain, uh, remains unexplained. A search ensued, but no suspects were found. That was the last officially confirmed murder by the Zodiac Killer. The Stein murder was initially thought to be a routine robbery that had escalated. However, in October, on October 13th, the San Francisco Chronicle received a new letter from Zodiac uh, containing a piece of bloody shirt and taking credit for the killing. The three teen witnesses worked with the police artist to prepare a composite sketch of Stein's killer. A few days later, this, this police artist returned working with the witnesses to prepare a second composite sketch of the killer. Detectives Bill Armstrong and Dave Toskey were assigned to the case. The San Francisco Police Department investigated an estimated 2,500 suspects over the period of years. And then the next uh, the next section is another long one talking about more letters. Okay, so that was all of the confirmed Zodiac killings. That's that's the ones that were without a doubt him that no one questions. So.
So I'm going to go on to the speculation. Uh, the next section says contemporary public speculation and zodiac claims. Various authors speculated at the time of the killings that other murders may have been the work of the zodiac, but none have been confirmed. And this is one, this first one is one that not a lot of people knew about. That, like, when I talk about, even the people I know that, you know, oh, I'm a huge fan of Zodiac. Which, okay, I always feel weird saying that because I always say I'm a fan of Zodiac. I'm not a fan of Zodiac. Like, I'm not like, oh, I don't, like, praise, praise Zodiac Killer. It's like, I, I'm interested in the case. So, that's a way to word it. There's other people I talk to. There's other people I talk to who are also interested in the case, but don't know this part. So, like, the first official case was, again, in... was the Lake Herman Road. Wait, Lake Herman Road was the first, right? I don't remember the names. Uh... Yes, Lake Herman Road is the first confirmed case, and, um, like, the movie covers Sherry Jo Bates, 18, stabbed to death, nearly decapitated on October 30th, 1966, at Riverside City College in Riverside. Bates' possible connection to the Zodiac only appeared four years after her murder, when San Francisco Chronicle reporter... Paul Avery received a tip regarding similarities between the Zodiac killings and the circumstances surrounding Bates' death. See, people know that. Because it was in the movie, and so everyone knows about it. But there is an even earlier one. So I watched a video on this several years ago, and I thought, nah, there's no way. That's way too early. But the more I looked into it, the more I'm convinced. Robert Domingos, 18, and Linda Edwards, 17, shot and killed on June 4th, 1963, on a beach near Gaviota. Probably pronounced that wrong. There are some specific similarities between their attack and Zodiac's attack at Lake Berryessa six years later. So when I first heard about that, I was like, no, nah, that's way too early. See, at least with with the Riverside killing, it's only two years before Lake Herman Road. But this is three years before that. So. So what really convinced me that this was Zodiac was there's... Another video I saw, it ta it showed it like the you know the crime scene and stuff, and there was like this cabin, like this like it's more of a shack that supposedly the killer was in or something. I don't remember. It's been years. I, I went looking for the video and I couldn't find it, but they found basically like the zodiac symbol and like the way they were killed and like basically everything about the attack it it was like you know <laughs> it's going to be a weird comparison we know Daredevil as you know he's in the red suit and you know all that but then in the Netflix series it showed him when he first starts getting into the the crime fighting he just has like a hoodie and like a little, like a ski mask, uh, uh, he just puts on like the cl cloth ski mask he puts over, and it's like it's the pre Daredevil Daredevil. Well, this feels like a pre Zodiac kill killer Zodiac killing, because it's it's like he's trying to find his method or whatever. But it still, it still screams Zodiac Killer to me. 
Okay, so moving on to Donna Lass, 25, last seen uh, September 6, 1970, in State Line, Nevada. A postcard with the Nav. Right, so it's actually the next day now. <laughs> um, apparently, the recording app I'm using now has a time limit and I didn't know this I was I stopped looking at my phone and just kept looking at the screen because I was reading my computer screen and I was like f several sections on and I looked down and it had stopped recording so, oh, so basically I was talking for half an hour and it wasn't even recording and I was just so frustrated I decided to wait until till now. It's that I started that recording yesterday at actually about 24 hours ago. I, I think I said the time in there, I don't remember, but now it's currently 1.29 a.m. Saturday. Halloween, October 31st. I'm going to I'm glad I did that half yesterday. I went ahead and I was going to go ahead and pre-record it so it was done. All I had to do was upload it when I got home from work. But it's a good thing I I went ahead and did that. So, if it happened now and I, I was like I'll just do it tomorrow. I'm too frustrated to do it now. Then it's I'd be posting it the day after Halloween. Yeah, I literally just got home from work. Like, I got home, changed, turned on the computer, and plugged in the microphone. So, I've been home for about five minutes. So, anyway, I'm not even going to rest first. I just, I want to get this out. Because, like I said, I want to get it done. Halloween morning, which is now. And now there's two parts I have to splice together. So, that's more work for me. I am not happy. <laughs> But I want to do this episode, so I'm going to get it over with. <laughs> also, one last thing. I, f um, because I was so frustrated yesterday, I actually, um, I set the microphone down, forgot to turn it off, so it died. So, I ha I, sp I plugged it in, and it's, it, I'm charging it from zero while recording at the same time, so. <clears throat> <laughs> so anyway, I I, look, I check to see when that cut off, and I'm gonna start from there. I'm just I'm just gonna read. I don't even care. I'm just gonna read. Donna last 25 last seen September 6th 1970 in State Line Nevada, a postcard with an advertisement for Forest Pines condominiums near Incline Village at Lake Tahoe. Pa uh, pasted on the back was received at the Chronicle on March 22, 1971. No evidence has been uncovered to connect Lass's disappearance with the Zodiac Killer, however. Kathleen Jones, 22, allegedly abducted on March 22, 1970 on Highway 132 near I-580 in an area west of Modesto. John's escaped from the car of a... Uh, John escaped from a car of a man who drove her and her infant daughter around the area between Stockton and Patterson at approxim for approximately an hour and a half. <clears throat> this next part, this next section is actually about her specifically. This um, Kathleen Jones, the one that was just uh, discussed in the, that I just literally just talked about, she was actually, her story was actually represented and uh, recreated in the movie Zodiac. It was slightly changed. The this okay. They the the movie stuck to the facts for the most part. Uh, this what they did here, and though it was they they deviated. There's there's the official police record, which is what I'm about to read, and then there is there's like speculation, or like there's multiple there's different versions of her story out there. But then there's, there's only one that's the official police record, and the movie didn't do that. It did, it did the, the one of the alternate versions. Of course, the alternate version was much more interesting. It's, so I kind of understand. It gets, it's like the same idea. But anyway, 
On the night of March 22, 1970, Kathleen Jones was driving from San Bernardino to uh, Padaluma to visit her mother. She was seven months pregnant and had her 10-month-old daughter beside her. I gotta keep watching my phone because now I'm nervous. <laughs> Uh, beside her, while heading west on Highway 132 near Modesto, a car behind her began honking its horn and flashing its, uh, its headlights. She pulled off the road and stopped. The man in the car parked behind her, approached her car, stated, uh, approached her car and stated he had observed her right real, rear, right rear, real. That is not easy to say. <laughs> Okay, this is one last time. Stated that he observed that her right rear wheel was wobbling and offered to tighten the lug nuts. After f finishing his work, the man drove off, yet when John pulled forward to re-enter the highway, the wheel almost immediately came off the car. The man returned, offering to drive her to the nearest gas station for help. She and her daughter climbed into his car. During the ride, the car passed several service stations, but the man did not stop. For about 90 minutes, he drove back and forth around the back roads near Tracy. When Johns asked why he was not stopping, he would change the subject. When the driver finally stopped at an intersection, Johns jumped out with her daughter and hid in a field. The driver searched for her using his flashlight, using his flashlight, telling her that he would not hurt her before eventually giving up. Unable to find her, he got back in his car and drove off. Johns hitched a ride to the police station in Patterson. When Johns gave her statement to the sergeant on duty, she noticed the police composite sketch of Paul Stein's killer and recognized him as the man who had abducted her and her child. Fearing he might come back and kill them all, the sergeant had Johns wait in the back at, an, at the nearby Mills restaurant. When her car was found, it had been gutted and torched. Most accounts say he threatened to kill her and her daughter while driving them around, but at least one police report disputes this. Who disputes that? John's account to Paul Avery of the Chronicle indicates her abductor left his car and searched for her in the dark with a flashlight. However, in one one report she made to the police, she stated he did not leave the vehicle. In the film, he gets it kind of. It kind of cuts a little bit, like it doesn't show like everything. Like he does, up to a certain point. Like like she's driving the car behind her, honks. I, I noticed the wheel doing that. He changes the tire. Uh, he uh, and then he loosens it, and then she starts to drive. The, the wheel comes off. He backs up, and he goes, "I guess it was worse than I thought. I can give you a ride to the gas station." And they pass a gas station, and she goes, uh, "We just passed a gas station," and he said, "It's closed." And then after like a few after like a few seconds, he said, "Before I kill you, I'm gonna watch you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw your baby out the window or something. I don't remember exactly what he said. I just watched it yesterday, and I still don't remember. But then like it cuts to another vehicle coming up upon a semi stopped in the middle of the road, and then she's screaming and telling them that about what happened, and then her baby is hidden in a field. So." Again, that version, it is more cinematic. It's more interesting, uh, you know, on on video, like on film. The 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 real version is it's interesting, but not as interesting. It is kind of like a small story, so they probably don't want to spend too much time on it. So it's it goes by in like two minutes, if that. So it, it's. Just like it's a story they they use and they like uh, allude to it later in the film, so they kind of like had to like mention at least like reenact it at some point, some way or another. It is kind of scary though, like the whole thing with all that. <clears throat> and then he wrote a letter to Paul Avery, which that one was. That one was mentioned in in the movie. On the Riverside murder, on October 30th, 1966, 18-year-old Sherry Jo Bates, a student in Riverside Community College, sp uh, spent the evening at campus at the campus library annex until it closed at 9 p.m. Neighbors reported hearing a scream around... Oh. 
Like, you'd be honest, at least now I have an excuse. I literally just got off work. I didn't even eat anything. Anyway, uh, a scream. And they, boom. Neighbors reported hearing a scream around 10.30 p.m. Bates was found dead the next morning, a short distance from the library between two abandoned houses slated for dim uh, to be demolished. Uh, demol demol <laughs> I said <laughs> demolized. <laughs> Demolished for campus renovations. The wires in her vault. What? Oh no. Okay. So the wires in her Volkswagen's distributor cap had been pulled out. I don't know anything about cars. She was brutally beaten and stabbed to death. A man's Timex watch was on uh, with a torn wristband was found nearby. The watch had stopped at 1224. But police believe the attack occurred much earlier. <sighs> Lake Tahoe disappearance there. Okay, there. <laughs> okay, uh, I know this is this goes kind of against what I said at the beginning of this episode, where I said I want to cover everything, but I'm still kind of frustrated about all that happened. I read like the next several sections, every little speculative thing that ha that he supposedly did. I read it last night. I don't want to go over it again. So, uh. There is a suspect, and that's a huge section here. Uh, he's covered in the in the film as being a suspect, and from from all this all the research I've done into the Zodiac Killer, I honestly don't know. I don't know if it was him. Uh, <laughs> I guess kind of part of the fun is. Nobody knows who he is, so the point at this, I'm not, I'm not gonna say who. There's, there's like three people that they, that some people think it is, and there's one who, everyone's for sure like that's the one, but I don't, I, he was ruled out with DNA, like the handwriting didn't fit, the shoe print didn't fit, the hand, the DNA didn't fit, fingerprint didn't fit, didn't match. Some of those I meant to say match. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so he's basically been ruled out, but still people are saying it had to have been him. So I, I, I don't know. For all we know, he wasn't even a suspect. Like the person, like the actual person who was literally Zodiac was never even a suspect or a person of interest. Wasn't even on their radar. So we don't know. Uh, public speculation. Let's see. Oh, okay, here's one that I kind of believe. Like, I don't... <laughs> I don't wholeheartedly believe this. Like, I don't... I don't say it as a fact. It's just kind of... Interesting. Ted Kaczynski, also known as the Unabomber, was investigated for possible connections to the Zodiac Killer in 1996. Kaczynski worked in Northern California at the time of the Zodiac murders, and like Zodiac, had an interest in cryptography and threatened the press into publishing his communications. Kaczynski was ruled out by both the FBI and SFPD based on fingerprint and handwriting comparisons, and by his absence from California on certain dates of known Zodiac activity. Okay, I didn't know that second half. I didn't know he was officially ruled out. I didn't even know they talked to him about it. I never, so I, I never really looked into it. It's just I know, like I looked into it enough to know that he was in the area. He lived in the area at the time, and it is a like kind of like a perfect like progression because, like I said, um, when he was wait, hang on, I don't even know if I discussed that. Where was? Mm. Did I cover? Let's see. I don't know if that was before then or not. Nineteen, yeah, nineteen sixty-three. I don't know if I covered that. Where is? Nineteen 
Okay, so I don't know if I covered what happened in 1963. So, uh, I'm just gonna assume that I did. Because, like, I know I, I know I covered it. I don't know if it was before or after it stopped recording. But, like, uh, supposedly he was... His, you know, there's evidence that he was killing in 1963. And, it, but it was like... Yeah, very simplistic as opposed uh, compared to his known confirmed killings, the five that we know of, and him moving on to because he did talk about creating a bomb and blowing, you know, blowing things up. The Zodiac did, and so it would kind of be a perfect progression from doing that to sm to mailing letter bombs, and like you know, actually making bombs. And like the thing said, he would write to the the press and say, "Hey, publish my thing, or this is gonna happen." So, like again, I'm not saying he was Zodiac. I'm just saying it's it's very possible. I didn't know that they had rolled it out. They they rolled it out. It doesn't because it says based on fingerprint and handwriting, but anyone can fake their handwriting. I'm not too I'm not too sold on the whole handwriting compare because they would do the handwriting comparison, and like. My handwriting it changes all the time. Like not like, like like I don't. I could write the same word like ten times in a row, and each word, each time I write it, it's completely different. So, not everyone writes identically every time. Like I I do my B's. I do I. <laughs> I actually get made fun of for the way I do B's. I actually uh, because because like at work I have to write a B. A, a, on a on a chart, I have to write a B and there's a few other letters regularly, so my coworkers see the way I write a B, and they they actually make fun of me for it, because most people they would do a B, they start at the bottom, go up, and then two loops, a uh, two wah, wah, down. I <laughs> start at the top, go down, and then wah, wah, up, and so my B's are unique, but again, each one is different. Like I don't do two B's I, the the same way, so I, I'm not too I'm not sold on the handwriting comparison, because like so many suspects were ruled out because the handwriting did the handwriting didn't match the the letters. So, yeah, like, I, I'm not I'm not convinced on that. The fingerprint. Okay, so the fingerprint they have is from Paul Stein's taxi cab. And I, I don't think that was Zodiac's fingerprint. Either that was an accident, like from one of the police officers or someone else, like because it was the fingerprint was in the blood, so it wasn't already there. That's how they know it's related to the crime. But I don't think it was Zodiac's because it's possible that it's either, like I said, like like somebody at the scene accidentally left their own fingerprint. If that's the case, well, why didn't they clear it already? Or it was fake. As in, Zodiac planted it because, like, he was, he's smart enough to, you know, he planned, like, all of this other stuff. He left, like, like no trace of anything else, but he left a fingerprint in the blood. I mean, he could have had a, been carrying a finger or something with him, like somebody else's finger that he cut off. Or something I don't know from what I've heard from what I've understood is they've never matched the fingerprint to anybody so if it was somebody on the investigation team I'm pretty sure they've all been fingerprinted just because like, like in the movie and I know in real life they do like it's called um, elimination prints because like when they got the first letter they uh, when the police came into the Chronicle. He said, "We need we need a set of elimination prints for everybody who did touch the letter." So they probably have like everybody who was like on the police force and the detectives and everyone. They probably already had their fingerprints on file. So if it was one of them, they would have probably cleared them, or like they would have been like, "Oh, you touched it, so this is a this isn't really this isn't the zodiac fingerprint." Okay, well. Okay, forget forget we found a fingerprint. 
Okay, and then I'm looking at some other public speculation, and the words Charles, uh, Charles Manson's Manson family cult is coming to mind. I mean, not coming to mind, it's popping out at me. Uh, so, Bruce Davis is a member of the family. He's a convicted murderer, was investigated, but no evidence linking him to the Zodiac murders was discovered. A 1970 report of the, of the, by the California Bureau of, Bureau, a Bureau of Criminal Investigation Identification and Investigation stated that all members of the all male members of the Manson family had been investigated and eliminated as Zodiac suspects. That is that is that that does make sense. I never even thought of that. It never occurred to me until now th to even think about the Manson family because I mean they were I think it was around I don't remember when the Manson family was like the, all that happened I I think it was like around then and it was in San Francisco I'm pretty sure <laughs> I sounded all confident and took it back <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was maybe possibly but yeah, like wow, I never even thought of that. But it did say that they were cleared. Uh. Oh, and then I skipped this one. Um, I didn't even think about it until now. Uh. We. <laughs> so, this was also in the movie, but they, they, it, it didn't really go anywhere. It just kind of, they just kind of dropped it. Police informants accused Navy, a U.S. Navy veteran, uh, Richard Reed Marshall, who, uh, the, uh, Rick Marshall in the movie, of being the Zodiac Killer, claiming that he privately hinted at being a murderer. Marshall lived in Riverside in 1966 and San Francisco in 1969. Ooh. Close to the scenes of the Bates and Stein murders, Oh yeah, I, I did look him up and it was so creepy. He did live like in the area that Paul Stein was murdered. And he lived uh, like a few houses, like a few, I think like a couple blocks away from, from Sherry Joe Bates. He was a silent film enthusiast and projectionist screening uh, Red Phantom, a name used by the author of a possible 1974 Zodiac letter. Detective Ken Narlow said that Marshall makes good reading, but is not a very good suspect, in my estimation. See, that's that's the problem with all these suspects. There's some really good suspects. Like if you were to look at uh, Rick Marshall's, like everything I just said, like like he lived close to two of the victims at the time they were murdered, and um, you know, there's some connections to like you know the naming conventions and um, all of that. And then like Ted Kaczynski, you know that makes sense for him. And then like um, the other like all the other ones listed. That's the problem with all of the suspects is they all sound good. Like oh this is it's definitely this one. No wait oh wait no it's definitely this one. Oh this this third one over here uh, it is definitely this one. And that's the problem. <laughs> I can okay. This is in retrospect. I'm reading a Wikipedia article where this information has already been, you know, this is already out there. They already knew all this. I'm reading this after the fact. Can you imagine being the police or the detectives at the time? And they had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of tips. And they had to sort through every one of them to come up with these names. I mean, some of them weren't even at the time. Like Ted Kaczynski, it says they interviewed him in 96. In so... Not not all of it was right then, and there's another name that just popped out at me, and now I lost it. I know I just saw that name. I don't know where it went. <laughs> um, maybe I had to scroll down. To, oh yes, because I scrolled up. That's why I couldn't see it because it was further down. Retired police detective Steve Hodel argues in his book. The Black Dalai, uh, the Black Dalai, the Black, mm, the Black Dahlia <laughs> Adventurer, that his father, George Hodel, was the Black Dahlia killer, whose victims include Elizabeth Short. You know, the Black Dahlia. It didn't, the Black Dahlia killer, 
It didn't include Elizabeth Short. Elizabeth Short was the Black Dahlia. Her nickname was Black Dahlia. Anyway, the book, the book led to the release of previously suppressed files and wire recordings by the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office of his father, which showed that the elder Holdell had indeed been a prime suspect in Short's murder. District Attorney Steve Kay subsequently wrote a letter which is published in the revised edition stating that if George Hodel were still alive, he would be prosecuted for the crimes. In a follow-up book, Hodel argued a circumstantial case that uh, a circumstantial case that his father was also the Zodiac killer, based on a police sketch. The similar similarity of the style of the Zodiac letters to the Black Dahlia Avenger letters, and questioned documents examinations. Hmm, that is interesting. I never thought to again. I never thought to connect the Black Dahlia murder with the Zodiac Killer. That is interesting. I wait. When was the Black Dahlia? I'm pretty sure that was the 30s or 40s. Let's see. Oh no. Uh. I think my signal is off. It is. I don't have a signal right now. Okay. Um, I have to connect my computer to my phone's hotspot. I don't have Wi-Fi. I have my phone's hotspot. So, I forgot to connect it when I... See, that's how quickly I got on here. Is I didn't even, I didn't even have time to, to do all of that. Uh, what's this? There's another tab here open that I don't remember opening. Mm. And now my computer froze. So that's a thing. Oh, there it is. As soon as I said that, it ha it unfroze. There we go. Loading Black Dahlia Wikipedia page. Maybe. No, my the Wi-Fi cut again. I don't know. Okay, whenever the Black Dahlia happened, I don't know when the Black Dahlia happened. My phone, my internet will not load. So, I don't, wait, is my... No, my hotspot's on, so... I don't know why it won't connect. It's... Not letting me. I don't like this. <laughs> If it would load, I would be happier. But, yeah. Okay, it looks like it's not going to load. Wait. Uh, now it's now it's loading as soon as I say that. I was, I was about to click over back to the Zodiac Killer Wikipedia page. And there it is. Okay. Yeah, that was a little far. Okay, um... The Black Dahlia murder was on July 15th, wow, January 15th, 1947, so uh, it's a little further away than, I mean, it's not impossible, like, it's not like, it, the Zodiac couldn't have been Jack the Ripper, like, it's not like that far apart. It's like a little over 20 years difference. So, I don't know. I mean, it's, again, it's not impossible. It's just, I don't see it. Uh, okay, let me look at the Black Dahlia Legacy. Is Zodiac even mentioned on here? Oh, that's talking about movies. Okay, no, I'm not going to read that. Anyway, back to... Zodiac. Mm. Okay, the, I'm not seeing anything else here that I want to read. But anyways, back to the Zodiac Wikipedia. I that's I wanted to cover that. I, I don't do true crime. Uh, I, I do want to cover some true crime. Probably better than this. <laughs> I... Will uh, I guess I'll end this now so I can edit it together because I have two 
audio files to splice together. So, yeah. You guys holding this now, and uh, I guess happy Halloween to everybody. <laughs>